This episode of Black Clock Audio Tales is brought to you by BunnySlippers.com. BunnySlippers.com. Check out their Wooly Bull Highland Cow Slippers. Their Shaggy Fun Slippers that you can wear around your house. Trust me, they look like they dust as I walk. I've, I've left a path definitely from the studio to, uh, to the kitchen. Anyway, BunnySlippers.com. This month we will be continuing with more W.B. Du Bois, and we will be listening to The Souls of Black Folk, which is a non-fiction piece, a uh, historical piece, a uh, piece of uh, uh, a historical fact. Um, yeah, enjoy. There's there's some music in here, and n- not by me. I didn't score any of this, but enjoy. The Souls of Black Folk by W.B. Du Bois. Here we go. The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois. Music and text recorded by Toria's uncle. Chapter 11 of the passing of the firstborn. O sister, sister, thy first begotten, the hands that cling and the feet that follow, the voice of the child's blood crying yet, who hath remembered me? Who hath forgotten? Thou hast forgotten, O summer swallow. But the world shall end when I forget. Swinburne. Unto you a child is born, sang the bit of yellow paper that fluttered into my room one brown October morning. Then the fear of fatherhood mingled wildly with the joy of creation. I wondered how it looked and how it felt. What were its eyes and how its hair curled and crumpled itself? And I thought in awe of her. She who had slept with death to tear a man-child from underneath her heart while I was unconsciously wandering. I fled to my wife and child, repeating the while to myself half-wonderingly, Wife and child. Wife and child. Fled fast and faster than boat and steam car, and yet must ever impatiently await them. Away from the hard-voiced city, Away from the flickering sea into my own Berkshire hills that sit all sadly guarding the gates of Massachusetts. Up the stairs I ran to the wan mother and whimpering babe, to the sanctuary on whose altar a life at my bidding had offered itself to win a life and won. What is this tiny, formless thing, this newborn whale from an unknown world, all head? and voice. I handle it curiously and watch perplexed its winking, breathing, and sneezing. I did not love it then. It seemed a ludicrous thing to love. But her I loved. My girl mother, she whom now I saw unfolding like the glory of the morning, the transfigured woman. Through her I came to love the wee thing, as it grew strong, as its little soul unfolded itself in twitter and cry and half-formed word, and as its eyes caught the gleam and flash of life. How beautiful he was, with his olive-tinted flesh and dark gold ringlets, his eyes of mingled blue and brown, his perfect little limbs, and the soft voluptuous roll which the blood of Africa had molded into his features, I held him in my arms after we had sped away from our southern home, 
held him and glanced at the hot red soil of Georgia and the breathless city of a hundred hills and felt a vague unrest. Why was his hair tinted with gold? An evil omen was golden hair in my life. Why had not the brown of his eyes crushed out and killed the blue? For brown were his father's eyes and his father's father's. And thus in the land of the color line I saw, as it fell across my baby, the shadow of the veil. Within the veil was he born, said I, and there within shall he live, a negro and a negro's son. Holding in that little head, ah, bitterly, the unbowed pride of a hunted race. Clinging with that tiny dimpled hand, ah, wearily, to a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful. And seeing with those bright, wondering eyes that peer into my soul, a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty a lie. I saw the shadow of the veil as it passed over my baby. I saw the cold city towering above the blood-red land. I held my face beside his little cheek, showed him the star children and the twinkling lights as they began to flash, and stilled with an even song the unvoiced terror of my life. So sturdy and masterful he grew, so filled with bubbling life, so tremulous with the unspoken wisdom of a life but eighteen months distant from the all-life, We were not far from worshipping this revelation of the divine, my wife and I. Her own life builded and molded itself upon the child. He tinged her every dream and idealized her every effort. No hands but hers must touch and garnish those little limbs. No dress or frill must touch them that had not wearied her fingers. No voice but hers could coax him off to dreamland. And she and he together spoke some soft and unknown tongue and in it held communion. I too mused above his little white bed, saw the strength of my own arm stretched onward through the ages, through the newer strength of his, saw the dream of my black father's stagger a step onward in the wild phantasm of the world, heard in his baby voice the voice of the prophet that was to rise within the veil. And so we dreamed and loved and planned by fall and winter and the full flush of the long southern spring till the hot winds rolled from the fetid gulf till the roses shivered and the still stern sun quivered its awful light over the hills of Atlanta and then one night the little feet pattered wearily to the wee white bed and the tiny hands trembled and a warm flushed face tossed on the pillow And we knew baby was sick. Ten days he lay there, a swift week, and three endless days, wasting, wasting away. Cheerily, the mother nursed him the first days and laughed into the little eyes that smiled again. Tenderly, she hovered round him till the smile fled away and fear crouched beside the little bed. Then the day ended not, and the night was a dreamless terror. And joy and sleep slipped away. I hear now that voice at midnight calling me from dull and dreamless trance, crying, the shadow of death, the shadow of death. Out into the starlight I crept to rouse the grave physician, the shadow of death, the shadow of death. The hours trembled on, the night listened, the ghastly dawn glided like a tired thing across the lamplight. Then we two alone looked upon the child as he turned toward us with great eyes and stretched his string-like hands, the shadow of death. And we spoke no word and turned away. He died at eventide when the sun lay like a brooding sorrow above the western hills, 
veiling its face. When the winds spoke not, and the trees, the great green trees he loved, stood motionless. I saw his breath beat quicker and quicker, pause, and then his little soul leapt like a star that travels in the night and left the world of darkness in its train. The day changed not. The same tall trees peeped in at the windows, the same green grass glinted in the setting sun. Only in the chamber of death writhed the world's most piteous thing, a childless mother. I shirk not. I long for work. I pant for a life full of striving. I am no coward to shrink before the rugged rush of the storm, nor even quail before the awful shadow of the veil. But hearken, O death, is not this my life hard enough? Is not that dull land that stretches its sneering web about me cold enough? Is not all the world beyond these four little walls pitiless enough, but that thou must needs enter here, thou, O death? About my head the thundering storm beat like a heartless voice, and the crazy forest pulsed with the curses of the weak. But what cared I within my home, beside my wife and baby boy? Was thou so jealous of one little coin of happiness that thou must needs enter there, thou, O death? A perfect life was his, all joy and love, with tears to make it brighter, sweet as a summer's day beside the Housatonic. The world loved him. The women kissed his curls. The men looked gravely into his wonderful eyes, and the children hovered and fluttered about him. I can see him now changing like the sky from sparkling laughter to darkening frowns, and then to wondering thoughtfulness as he watched the world. He knew no color line, poor dear. And the veil, though it shadowed him, had not yet darkened half his son. He loved the white matron, he loved his black nurse, and in his little world walked souls alone, uncolored and unclothed. I, yea, all men, were larger and purer by the infinite breadth of that one little life. She who in simple clearness of vision sees beyond the stars said when he had flown, he will be happy there. He ever loved beautiful things. And I, far more ignorant and blind by the web of mine own weaving, sit alone, winding words and muttering, if still he be, and he be there, and there be a there, let him be happy. No fate. Blythe was the morning of his burial with bird and song and sweet-smelling flowers. The trees whispered to the grass, but the children sat with hushed faces. And yet it seemed a ghostly, unreal day, the wraith of life. We seemed to rumble down an unknown street behind a little white bundle of posies with the shadow of a song in our ears. The busy city dinned about us. They did not say much. Those pale-faced, hurrying men and women, they did not say much. They only glanced and said, Niggers. We could not lay him in the ground there in Georgia, for the earth there is strangely red. So we bore him away to the northward, with his flowers and his little folded hands, in vain, in vain. For where, O oh God, beneath thy broad blue sky shall my dark baby rest in peace, where reverence dwells and goodness and a freedom that is free? All that day and all that night there sat an awful gladness in my heart. Nay, blame me not if I see the world thus darkly through the veil. And my soul whispers ever to me, saying, Not dead, not dead, but escaped. Not bond, but free. No bitter meanness now shall sicken his baby heart till it die a living death. No taunt shall madden his happy boyhood. 
Fool that I was to think or wish that this little soul should grow choked and deformed within the veil. I might have known that yonder deep, unworldly look that ever and anon floated past his eyes was fearing far beyond this narrow now. In the poise of his little curl-crowned head did there not sit all that wild pride of being which his father had hardly crushed in his own heart? For what, forsooth, shall a negro want with pride amid the studied humiliations of fifty million fellows? Well sped, my boy, before the world had dubbed your ambition insolence and held your ideals unattainable and taught you to cringe and bow. Better far this nameless void that stops my life than a sea of sorrow for you. Idle words. He might have borne his burden more bravely than we. I and found it lighter too, some day. For surely, surely this is not the end. Surely there shall yet dawn some mighty morning to lift the veil and set the prisoned free. Not for me, I shall die in my bonds but for fresh young souls who have not known the night and wake into the morning. A morning when men ask of the workman, not, is he white, but can he work? When men ask artists, not, are they black, but do they know? Some morning this may be, long, long years to come. But now there wails on that dark shore within the veil the same deep voice thou shalt forgo. And all have I forgone at that command. And with small complaint, all save that fair young form that lies so coldly wed with death in the nest I had builded. If one must have gone, why not I? Why may I not rest me from this restlessness and sleep from this wide waking? Was not the world's alembic time in his young hands? And is not my time waning? Are there so many workers in the vineyard that the fair promise of this little body could lightly be tossed away? The wretched of my race that line the alleys of the nation sit fatherless and unmothered, but love sat beside his cradle, and in his ear wisdom waited to speak. Perhaps now he knows the all love and needs not to be wise. Sleep then, child. Sleep till I sleep and wake into a baby voice and the ceaseless patter of little feet above the veil. End of chapter 11. The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois Music and Text Recorded by Toria's Uncle Chapter 12 Of Alexander Crummel Then from the dawn it seemed there came, but faint, as from beyond the limit of the world, like the last echo born of a great cry, sounds, as if some fair city were one voice around a king returning from his wars. Tennyson
This is the story of a human heart, the tale of a black boy who many long years ago began to struggle with life that he might know the world and know himself. Three temptations he met on those dark dunes that lay gray and dismal before the wonder eyes of the child. The temptation of hate that stood out against the red dawn. The temptation of despair that darkened noonday. And the temptation of doubt that ever steals along with twilight. Above all, you must hear of the veils he crossed, the valley of humiliation, and the valley of the shadow of death. I saw Alexander Crummel first at a Wilberforce commencement season, amid its bustle and crush. Tall, frail, and black he stood, with simple dignity, and an unmistakable air of good breeding. I talked with him apart, where the storming of the lusty young orators could not harm us. I spoke to him politely, then curiously, then eagerly as I began to feel the fineness of his character, his calm courtesy, the sweetness of his strength, and his fair blending of the hope and truth of life. Instinctively, I bowed before this man as one bows before the prophets of the world. Some seer, he seemed, that came not from the crimson past or the gray to come, but from the pulsing now that mocking world which seemed to me at once so light and dark, so splendid and sordid. Fourscore years had he wandered in this same world of mine within the veil. He was born with a Missouri compromise, and lay a-dying amid the echoes of Manila and El Cane, stirring times for living, times dark to look back upon, darker to look forward to. The black-faced lad that paused over his mud and marbles seventy years ago saw puzzling vistas as he looked down the world. The slave ship still groaned across the Atlantic. Faint cries burdened the southern breeze. And the great black father whispered mad tales of cruelty into those young ears. From the low doorway the mother silently watched her boy at play, and at nightfall sought him eagerly, lest the shadows should bear him away to the land of slaves. So his young mind worked, and winced and shaped curiously a vision of life. And in the midst of that vision ever stood one dark figure alone, ever with the hard, thick countenance of that bitter father and a form that fell in vast and shapeless folds. Thus the temptation of hate grew and shadowed the growing child, gliding stealthily into his laughter, fading into his play, and seizing his dreams by day and night with rough, rude turbulence. So the black boy asked of sky and sun and flower the never answered, Why? And loved, as he grew, neither the world nor the world's rough ways. Strange temptation for a child, you may think. And yet in this wide land today a thousand thousand dark children brood before this same temptation and feel its cold and shuddering arms. For then perhaps someone will someday lift the veil, will come tenderly and cheerily into those sad little lives and brush the brooding hate away, just as Beriah Green strode in upon the life of Alexander Crummel. And before the bluff, kind-hearted man, the shadow seemed less dark. Beriah Green had a school in Oneida County, New York, with a score of mischievous boys, I'm going to bring a black boy here to educate, said Beriah Green, as only a crank and an abolitionist would have dared to say. Ho, ho, laughed the boys. Yes, said his wife, and Alexander came. Once before, the black boy had sought a school, had traveled, cold and hungry, 400 miles up into free New Hampshire, to Canaan. But the godly farmers hitched 90 yoke of oxen to the abolition schoolhouse, and dragged it into the middle of the swamp. The black boy trudged away. The 19th was the first century of human sympathy, the age when, half-wonderingly, we began to descry in others that transfigured spark of divinity which we call myself. 
when clodhoppers and peasants and tramps and thieves and millionaires and sometimes negroes became throbbing souls whose warm pulsing life touched us so nearly that we half gasped with surprise crying thou too hast thou seen sorrow and the dull waters of hopelessness hast thou known life and then all helplessly we peered into those other worlds and wailed o oh, world of worlds how shall man make you one so in that little Oneida school, there came to those schoolboys a revelation of thought and longing beneath one black skin, of which they had not dreamed before. And to the lonely boy came a new dawn of sympathy and inspiration. The shadowy formless thing, the temptation of hate that hovered between him and the world, grew fainter and less sinister. It did not wholly fade away, but diffused itself and lingered thick at the edges. Through it, the child now first saw the blue and gold of life, the sun-swept road that ran twixt the heaven and earth until, in one far-off wan wavering line, they met and kissed. A vision of life came to the growing boy, mystic, wonderful. He raised his head, stretched himself, breathed deep of the fresh new air. Yonder, behind the forests, he heard strange sounds. Then, glinting through the trees, he saw far, far away the bronzed host of a nation calling, calling faintly, calling loudly. He heard the hateful clank of their chains. He felt them cringe and grovel, and there arose within him a protest and a prophecy, and he girded himself to walk down the world. A voice and vision called him to be a priest, a seer to lead the uncalled out of the house of bondage. He saw the headless host turn toward him like the whirling of mad waters. He stretched forth his hands eagerly, and then, even as he stretched them, suddenly there swept across the vision the temptation of despair. They were not wicked men. The problem of life is not the problem of the wicked. They were calm, good men, bishops of the apostolic church of God, and strove toward righteousness. They said slowly, It is all very natural, it is even commendable, but the General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church cannot admit a Negro. And when that thin, half-grotesque figure still haunted their doors, they put their hands kindly, half-sorrowfully, on his shoulders, and said, Now, of course, we, we know how you feel about it, but you see, it is impossible, that is, well, it is premature. Sometime we trust, sincerely trust, all such distinctions will fade away, but now the world is as it is. This was the temptation of despair, and the young man fought it doggedly. Like some grave shadow, he flitted by those halls, pleading, arguing, half-angrily demanding admittance, until there came the final no. Until men hustled the disturber away, marked him as foolish, unreasonable, and injudicious a vain rebel against God's law. And then from that vision splendid, all the glory slowly faded away and left an earth gray and stern, rolling on beneath a dark despair. Even the kind hands that stretched themselves toward him from out the depths of that dull morning seemed but parts of the purple shadows. He saw them coldly and asked, why should I strive by special grace when the way of the world is closed to me? All gently yet, the hands urged him on. The hands of young John Jay, that daring father's daring son. The hands of the good folk of Boston, that free city. And yet, with a way to the priesthood of the church open at last before him, the cloud lingered there. And even when in old St. Paul's the venerable bishop raised his white arms above the Negro deacon, even then the burden had not lifted from that heart, for there had passed a glory from the earth. And yet the fire through which Alexander Crummel went did not burn in vain. Slowly and more soberly he took up again his plan of life. More critically he studied the situation. Deep down below the slavery and servitude of the Negro people, he saw their fatal weaknesses, which long years of mistreatment had emphasized. 
the dearth of strong moral character, of unbending righteousness, he felt, was their great shortcoming. And here he would begin. He would gather the best of his people into some little Episcopal chapel, and there lead, teach, and inspire them, till the leaven spread, till the children grew, till the world hearkened, till, till, and then across his dream gleamed some faint afterglow of that first fair vision of youth, only an afterglow, for there had passed a glory from the earth. One day, it was in 1842, and the springtide was struggling merrily with the May winds of New England, he stood at last in his own chapel in Providence, a priest of the church. The days sped by, and the dark young clergyman labored. He wrote his sermons carefully. He intoned his prayers with a soft, earnest voice. He haunted the streets and accosted the wayfarers. He visited the sick and knelt beside the dying. He worked and toiled week by week, day by day, month by month. And yet month by month the congregation dwindled. Week by week the hollow walls echoed more sharply. Day by day the calls came fewer and fewer. And day by day the third temptation sat clearer and still more clearly within the veil. A temptation, as it were, bland and smiling, with just a shade of mockery in its smooth tones. First it came casually in the cadence of a voice. Oh, colored folks, yes. Or perhaps more definitely, what do you expect? In voice and gesture lay the doubt, the temptation of doubt. How he hated it and stormed at it furiously. Of course they are capable, he cried. Of course they can learn and strive and achieve. And, of course, added the temptation softly, they do nothing of the sort. Of all the three temptations, this one struck the deepest. Hate, he had outgrown so childish a thing. Despair, he had steeled his right arm against it and fought it with the vigor of determination. But to doubt the worth of his life work, to doubt the destiny and capability of the race his soul loved because it was his, to find listless squalor instead of eager endeavor, to hear his own lips whispering, They do not care, they cannot know, they are dumb-driven cattle. Why cast your pearls before swine? This, this seemed more than man could bear. And he closed the door and sank upon the steps of the chancel and cast his robe upon the floor and writhed. The evening sunbeams had set the dust to dancing in the gloomy chapel when he arose. He folded his vestments put away the hymn books, and closed the great Bible. He stepped out into the twilight, looked back upon the narrow little pulpit with a weary smile, and locked the door. Then he walked briskly to the bishop and told the bishop what the bishop already knew. I have failed, he said simply, and gaining courage by the confession, he added, what I need is a larger constituency. There are comparatively few Negroes here, and perhaps they are not of the best. I must go where the field is wider and try again. So the bishop sent him to Philadelphia with a letter to Bishop Onderdonk. Bishop Onderdonk lived at the head of six white steps, corpulent, red-faced, and the author of several thrilling tracts on apostolic succession. It was after dinner, and the bishop had settled himself for a pleasant season of contemplation when the bell must needs ring, and there must burst in upon the bishop a letter and a thin, ungainly negro. Bishop Underdonk read the letter hastily and frowned. Fortunately, his mind was already clear on this point, and he cleared his brow and looked at Crummel. Then he said slowly and impressively, I will receive you into this diocese on one condition. No negro priest can sit in my church convention and no Negro church must ask for a representation there. I sometimes fancy that I can see that tableau, the frail black figure nervously twitching his hat before the massive abdomen of Bishop Onderdonk, 
his threadbare coat thrown against the dark woodwork of the bookcases, where Fox's Lives of the Martyrs nestled happily beside the whole duty of man. I seemed to see the wide eyes of the Negro wander past the bishop's broadcloth to where the swinging glass doors of the cabinet glow in the sunlight. A little blue fly is trying to cross the yawning keyhole. He marches briskly up to it, peers into the chasm in a surprised sort of way, and rubs his feelers reflectively. Then he essays its depths, and finding it bottomless, draws back again. The dark-faced priest finds himself wondering if the fly, too, has faced its valley of humiliation, and if it will plunge into it, when, lo, it spreads its tiny wings and buzzes merrily across, leaving the watcher wingless and alone. Then the full weight of his burden fell upon him, The rich walls wheeled away, and before him lay the cold, rough moor winding on through life, cut in twain by one thick granite ridge, here the valley of humiliation, yonder the valley of the shadow of death. And I know not which be darker, no, not I. But this I know, in yonder vale of the humble stand today a million swarthy men, who willingly would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the worthy takes. All this and more would they bear, did they but know that this were sacrifice and not a meaner thing. So surged the thought within that lone black breast, The bishop cleared his throat suggestively, then, recollecting that there was really nothing to say, considerately, said nothing, only sat tapping his foot impatiently. But Alexander Crummel said, slowly and heavily, I will never enter your diocese on such terms. And saying this, he turned and passed into the valley of the shadow of death. You might have noted only the physical dying, the shattered frame and hacking cough, but in that soul lay deeper death than that. He found a chapel in New York, the church of his father. He labored for it in poverty and starvation, scorned by his fellow priests. Half in despair, he wandered across the sea, a beggar with outstretched hands. Englishmen clasped them, Wilberforce and Stanley, Thurwell and Inglis, even Froude and Macaulay. Sir Benjamin Brodie bade him rest a while at Queen's College in Cambridge, and there he lingered, struggling for health of body and mind until he took his degree in 53. Restless still and unsatisfied, he turned toward Africa, and for long years amid the spawn of the slave smugglers sought a new heaven and a new earth. So the man groped for light. All this was not life. It was the world wandering of a soul in search of itself, the striving of one who vainly sought his place in the world, ever haunted by the shadow of a death that is more than death, the passing of a soul that has missed its duty. Twenty years he wandered, twenty years and more, and yet the hard rasping question kept gnawing within him What in God's name am I on earth for? In the narrow New York parish, his soul seemed cramped and smothered. In the fine old air of the English university, he heard the millions wailing over the sea. In the wild, fever-cursed swamps of West Africa, he stood helpless and alone. You will not wonder at his weird pilgrimage, you who in the swift whirl of living amid its cold paradox and marvelous vision have fronted life and asked its riddle face to face. And if you find that riddle hard to read, remember that yonder black boy finds it just a little harder. If it is difficult for you to find and face your duty, it is a shade more difficult for him. If your heart sickens in the blood and dust of battle, remember that to him the dust is thicker and the battle fiercer. No wonder the wanderers fall. No wonder we point to thief 
and murderer and haunting prostitute and the never-ending throng of unhearsed dead, the valley of the shadow of death gives few of its pilgrims back to the world. But Alexander Crummel, it gave back. Out of the temptation of hate and burned by the fire of despair, triumphant over doubt and steeled by sacrifice against humiliation, he turned at last home across the waters, humble and strong, gentle and determined. He bent to all the jibes and prejudices, to all hatred and discrimination, with that rare courtesy which is the armor of pure souls. He fought among his own, the low, the grasping, and the wicked, with that unbending righteousness which is the sword of the just. He never faltered. He seldom complained. He simply worked, inspiring the young, rebuking the old, helping the weak, guiding the strong. So he grew and brought within his wide influence all that was best of those who walk within the veil. They who live without knew not nor dreamed of that full power within, that mighty inspiration which the dull gauze of caste decreed that most men should not know. And now that he is gone, I sweep the veil away and cry, Lo, the soul to whose dear memory I bring this little tribute. I can see his face still, dark and heavy-lined beneath his snowy hair, lighting and shading, now with inspiration for the future, now in innocent pain at some human wickedness, now with sorrow at some hard memory from the past. The more I met Alexander Crummel, the more I felt how much that world was losing which knew so little of him. In another age he might have sat among the elders of the land in purple-bordered toga. In another country, mothers might have sung him to the cradles. He did his work. He did it nobly and well. And yet, I sorrow that here he worked alone with so little human sympathy. His name today in this broad land means little and comes to fifty million ears laden with no incense of memory or emulation. And herein lies the tragedy of the age. Not that men are poor, all men know something of poverty. Not that men are wicked, who is good. Not that men are ignorant, what is truth. Nay, but that men know so little of men. He sat one morning gazing toward the sea. He smiled and said, The gate is rusty on their hinges. That night at starrise, a wind came moaning out of the west to blow the gate ajar. And then the soul I loved fled like a flame across the seas, and in its seat sat death. I wonder where he is today. I wonder if in that dim world beyond, as he came gliding in, there rose on some wan throne a king, a dark and pierced Jew, who knows the writhings of the earthly damned, saying, as he laid those heart-wrung talents down, Well done. While round about the morning stars sat singing, End of chapter 12.